Hello, everybody. I'm going to go ahead to share my desktop right now. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we got you. Okay. Um, thanks for taking time um, out of your day to uh, to share your lunch time with us today. Uh, my name is uh, Carla Blarin, uh, as you can see on the screen. I'm just going to start the deck uh, right now. That's just some information about me. I work for Nidesic and I'm a principal uh, consultant. Uh, I know we're all telling you folks, uh, just some assumptions here uh, that uh, uh, I believe we understand the fundamentals of SSIs uh, from 2005 and 2008. Uh, you <clears throat> you've have some moderate uh, to minimal development uh, within the 2005 and 2008 SSIs. You understand the uh, SSI's configuration uh, on 2005 and 8, and you understand the concept of a master package calling a child package. So uh, uh, those are the assumptions I put in place. Uh, today we're going to be talking about improvement in uh, Microsoft SQL Server Integration Services, simply known as SSI's 2012. That's what we all call it. Uh, the session objectives is uh, what you're looking at in front of you. I'll be covering SQL, uh, SSI's 2012 features. I will demo the developer experience. Um, I'll focus on change in the character. I'll talk about integration services catalog. To me, it's probably one of the uh, best features out there for SSI's 2012. And I would also demo our project development model uh, for a typical uh, enterprise ETL. Okay, what is SSI? Uh, this is just a quick way to recap on what SSI is all about. It's an ETL tool that allows you to uh, extract from source systems. I have some listed out there. You could transform. It has a lot of transform. Uh, quick ones are derived surrogate, uh, merge transforms. Um, it's, it's comparable to all the uh, enterprise ETL tools out there. Uh, it has the capability to load as well to different destinations, and there are so many uh, attributes and configurations that could be configured for those databases. Basically, the flow uh, for SSIs is uh, data is read from sources, is pushed into memory, and optionally, you could uh, go through uh, one or more transformations and then write the destination to, to disk in the form of a relation, a database, or a file. And there is a control flow area that allows you to audit the execution of the task. So that is just a summary of what SSI so is all about and the way uh, and the way it works. SQL 2012 has uh, been a lot of improvements uh, uh, from 2005 to 2008, but I believe 2012 compares to the type of improvement that we saw from 2000 to 2005. Uh, the, the UI has been considerably uh, improved upon. Uh, the, the visualizations, uh, I think they're just really cool, and I will demo uh, some of those uh, today. We have the ability now to zoom in and out, uh, undo. Um, you know, when you make a mistake, you can undo your changes. Uh, those of you familiar with 2005 and 08 uh, realized the Visual Studio toolbox uh, wasn't just too appropriate. Uh, now there is exercise toolbox with favorites. Uh, built into it. You could uh, tag whatever you want as favorite uh, in the toolbox. Uh, in defining source and destination, there's a wizard that would help, help you to leverage your existing connection uh, defined within the project or package. And there's this new concept of grouping, which is it just a way to make your package look good. Uh, the fact that you could do that within the data flow, I think, is just a very good addition to exercise 2012. Like I said earlier, we're going to be talking about uh, even demoing change data capture. It was available in 2008, uh, 2008. It's been improved upon as far as the configuration I set up in 2012. Uh, just, I'm not going to read through everything. I'm just going to highlight the the ones that to me I believe are cool. Uh, expression task has been called out. Uh, one of the issues with uh, reading existing packages in exercise is it's trying to find out where the expressions have been kind of eating in all the packages. Now you can actually call them out as a task within your data 
within within your uh, control flow. Um, so that will be obvious to know where uh, expressions have been uh, leveraged. Uh, one of the cool things that we now have is a uh, concept of parameters. Uh, you could have parameters. It's, it's not replacing variables. It just allows you to, uh, you, you could look at it as a read-only variable that allows you to interface with your project and package from outside of the package uh, for execution purposes. Uh, it could be scoped at the project level. It could also be scoped at the package level, and I will demo uh, that today. Um, it's, it's kind of a replacement. I mean, working with uh, environment and environmental variables, a place mainly known as packet configuration, uh, packet configuration uh, in 2005 and 2008. Uh, one of the cool features is Share Connection Manager. Uh, it, 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 we had it in 2008, uh, but the ability to to do that was limited to within the package, uh, so within, within, within the package to be able to share, uh, for example, caches uh, within the package. A good example is when you're doing lookups. I'm going to demo how uh, you'll be able to take the beyond your package to share caches across packages, and I think that is cool for some kind of enterprise scenarios on there. Uh, it also allows you to, of course, parameterize, and the shared cache is, uh, is pretty cool, and I would show that. Environments, uh, that is what uh, literally replaces uh, what we know as package configuration. Um, the, you can control um, what uh, the, the parameters you define at the package and project level. Uh, you could control both, actually, through environments and environment variables. And, and I would also demo that uh, towards the end of this presentation to see how to replace uh, packet configuration uh, with uh, the concept of environment variables, leveraging parameters and environment variables. So with the concept of environment, environment leveraging parameters and environment uh, variables. Data types uh, work like data view, which is our runtime in uh, Visual Studio in 2008, allows you to see what is going through your pipeline in the uh, data flow. Uh, but it takes it a step further. It allows you to not just do that design time. It allows you to do it outside of the packet itself. Uh, you could use a stop procedure to set up data types, uh, which you would just at any point in your data flow, uh, in, in your control flow, you'd be able to pipe the data uh, in there uh, to a test file, for example, and you could control it uh, using Transat SQL. The beauty of that is it, uh, it's going to enhance troubleshooting. Uh, you deploy a package to production, and the and for whatever reason, you're not getting the right results, and you cannot open the package using Visual Studio in production, of course. The data types allows you to have the same effect that you had in development using data viewer to see the data, uh, uh, you know, uh, what this package is running, and check the results in, like, a test file or whatever format. Uh, there's so many other uh, kind of uh, improvements out there. Uh, the functions are, you know, there's this replace the functions in there. Ability of exercise to undo files uh, and undo delimiter uh, within within files has been uh, enhanced. The performance of merge joins have uh, been um, have been enhanced as well. I've not based Mac that, but uh, based on Microsoft documentation, that uh, those have been enhanced as well. Okay. Okay, I just went through uh, high level uh, most of the important features of uh, SSIS 2012. I just want to call out uh, a few of them that I believe in my experience that uh, kind of uh, improve uh, developers' uh, experience. Um, one of them is the SSIS toolbox. It allows you to arrange your toolbox the way it suits you. You could uh, select your favorite transforms and put them, you know, in, 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 in a category or grouping that allows you to get to them uh, faster. We also have the source and destination wizard that allows you to quite uh, quickly set up uh, sources and destination well within exercise uh, development area. I talked about the change data capture already. Uh, the new execute SSIS packet task, I uh, would uh, demo that. Uh, most of you remember in 2005 and 2008, uh, in order to have a master packet call a, a child packet, you, you use a combination of um, uh, parent variable. Uh, sometimes you might even have to use environment variable. 
uh, in order to do that, this is a little bit kind of clunky. But now uh, it's been simplified to just a package, and then you are assigning parameters between parent and child, or uh, parameters and or variables between parent and child. So it's kind of simplified now in order to do that. I already talked about data types, so it allows you to troubleshoot uh, after you deploy uh, your solution into production, it allows you to uh, to tap into different areas of your package to get the output out into a file that you could use uh, to find out what is happening within the package. Uh, the, I also would like to talk about the package catalog at this point. Uh, it's a kind of repository. Uh, it's a welcome addition to 2012. It's all this, uh, most of what we're talking about today as we the deployment environment and parameters. They all come together because now we have a central repository uh, for uh, for SSIS, and I will be talking about later in this demo, and I would also uh, demo demo that as well. It it allows you to have a real integration uh, within that. It has built-in features that I will talk about uh, later. Okay, right now I'd like to go to the demo to just uh, show you some of the developers' experience that I was uh, talking about. Okay, this is the um, new field of uh, SSIs. Um, to get here, just to, to get here, uh, you could go through the SQL Server Data Tools. Uh, you could go through. Um, uh, you could go to. Uh, you, you could go to the Data Tool. Uh, you could also go to Visual Studio 2010. Either uh, one of those would take you to this page. Uh, you remember when I was talking about the, the cool uh, features of, of SSIs. You can see here on the left-hand side, this is the SSI toolbox. Uh, you can see the icons are different. Uh, I believe they're better. Uh, you have favorite here. Um, the categorization, default categorization that comes out with the tool is pretty cool. Uh, but if you're not happy with that, you could right-click and move to favorites. You could move to other tasks and so on and so forth. And if you mess that up, you could restore your toolbox to your default. So it allows you to uh, pretty much configure this the way that you would you would really uh, you really like. Uh, I'll put a sample uh, kind of uh, configuration here together in order to show uh, some of the stuff uh, that I just spoke about. You can see from here uh, the expression task that I talked about. A very good example is here. This is an expression task. And what I'm doing in here, I'm assigning value to a variable called STG table uh, query name. I'm, I'm writing the expression, leveraging the table in order to derive this. Prior to uh, 2012, this is something you probably have that variable, and then you would uh, put the definition in the variable, and then you would hide that expression somewhere in there. Somebody running the packet might not you know, quite easily find it. But here you're calling it out and becomes obvious uh, what is uh, what is there. And you've also noticed um, variables are available here. Uh, the icons are different, but the concept is still is still the same uh, here. Uh, the usage of uh, connection managers. Uh, here you can see I uh, define a connection manager at the project level. You could have connection managers. At, uh, at the packet level, in, in what we're looking at right now, AdventureWorks is at the packet level, and AdventureWorks GW, both these two, uh, or these three, at the packet level, and this is at the uh, project level. You could right click on the packet level and convert it to uh, project level and vice versa, so it's, it's quite flexible. Uh, this uh, in an enterprise environment, I would, of course, see most of the connections that you're going to be using across all your packages in your framework will, will be at the project level, and only connections that are specific to, uh, to a particular package uh, that would not be leveraged by other packages will be at the, at the packet level. But if you do make a mistake, uh, you could go back and, and kind of promote a package uh, level uh, connection to uh, to a project uh, project level uh, connection. Uh, what I'm showing here, uh, I talked about the simplified view of a, a package calling a master package. What we're looking at here is I pulled in an execute uh, execute package task, uh, just like that. I put that here. 
and I put it here to call the child package. Uh, this is similar to the way we've always uh, done it in 2005. You can see the reference type. You can see here it says project reference. So it's easy for you to just go to the project and pull down the, the child package. The simplified way of passing parameters. In this case, I am passing the job run ID. Uh, in order for this demo, I'm passing the job run ID. These are from here you will see the, all the system variables, system variables and uh, user variable. And also, if you have uh, uh, parameters in there, you'll be able to pass that from here and pass it to the master ETL job ID. Uh, this is just so simple, so you could pass as many as you like here from parent to child by just uh, doing a quick uh, binding between them. And I believe that's a very welcome improvement uh, in, in, in 2005. Uh, the other thing I would like to call out here on this page uh, will be the concept of parameters. Um, the parameters could be at two levels, uh, at the package, at the project. At the packing level, uh, you have parameters here, and it's as simple as just you know clicking on this icon here on the, on the top left, defining your parameter name, uh, defining the type, uh, define if you want it to be uh, sensitive, case sensitive, and if you want it to be required for some description, and, and, and you're done with that. Uh, if you want to define a project level parameter, if you come here, uh, let me just cancel out of, out of that. Uh, if you add those countries, just for me a sec. I would come convert to deployment model. Here, yeah, uh, this 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 uh, project here is in the old format. Uh, I uh, I could convert this to the I could convert this to package uh, model deployment. So you could have your you could have your solution uh, in the package deployment model. By the way, is 2005 and 2008 deployment model, and you could you could move from uh, the project based, which is what we have right now, to uh, package deployment model, uh, because the, the, the deal is if the default for converted um, solution is the package deployment model, uh, but you could convert that to, uh, to the project based. And one of the good things here is if you build a framework that is using package configuration and you rather stick to the way you were doing it before, uh, SSS 2012 allows you to to be able to uh, to be able to do that. Um, the edit flow, um, the the icons of visualization have been improved. Uh, you can see from here. I just want to call this out because I would I would talk about this in my uh, I'll talk about this in the next presentation uh, because what we're looking at here is I'm selecting from a from a table. This is a table called uh, lookup. I pull this source table. I do some conversion there. I do a lookup on the model. Uh, if there is no match, I put in an unknown. And lookup on category translation. And I use a uh, slowly changing dimension. Um, I'm putting everything, to, I'm ending everything with a count uh, for this demo. And this is the insert. Because I'm going to talk about, uh, about sharing caches. Uh, and in order to do that, I want to show you the difference between this is a straight lookup where I'm doing a full cache and I'm using OLEDB. Uh, as part of 2012, this user experience, uh, I wanted to show you how you could share cache between uh, across multiple packages. For example, if you have you're loading multiple fact tables and you have those fact tables uh, as different packages like some of us would have in our framework, and you have a, a maybe an employee uh, dimension that you you want to be able to share across all these all these packages. You could cache that and just use the cache across all the packages. So I'm going to show you a good example where I've I've done that. Here, what I've done here is uh, I created a a cache uh, for Dim product. And if you look at the data flow, uh, what is on here? The only difference here. This is a typical data flow. Um, it's leveraging adventure works. I'm just selecting uh, two columns there, top 100. Uh, I brought in a, tra a cache transform, which is available now uh, here. 
it, we had it in 2012, uh, sorry, 2008, uh, but now uh, the ability to to run it across packages, I believe, is cool. Uh, so here I'm using the cache connection manager and just bringing those two columns columns down and the file. Just bear with me one sec. Okay. If I go to the cache manager just to show you where um, I'm doing a file system cache and I'm caching it to this uh, CAW file right here. So the setup is just uh, put a source and send the data to uh, to the cache transform. In order to leverage that, I created another another package to consume uh, the the cache. The package is the same as the DIM product that I went through before. The only thing I've done differently here is within the data flow, instead of using the um, instead of using the the old LEDB connection manager in here. Uh, I'm using the cache uh, connection manager here. Uh, let me just go back here to show you. Um, uh, just uh, hold on one sec. Let me go back here. You can see here I'm using the LEDB uh, connection manager, uh, the full cache. And if I run this, I'm running it. I need to show you uh, the, the, the number of matches there. I'm running this on VM, so it's um, okay. While it's running, it's still uh, it's still trying to do that. While that is running, let me just uh, continue there. Okay, I will stop. So let me, I'll just say with that, so I want it to run real quick. Now we'll go ahead and run it again. Okay. Uh, running this, you can see from here, I had a match of 295 and a lookup no match of 209. So I'll go ahead and, and go to the lookup that is using the cache. Like I said, the difference between them is here, I'm using the cache. And in, <coughs> and in the cache here, so if I run this, this is using the cache that we sent to file. I yeah, need to stop that. Okay, you come in here. You notice here that there is no match of 299. I had 209 before. Now I have no match of 299. The reason is in the definition of the of the cache here. When I was creating the cache here, I was only selecting the top hundred. So it had less records uh, to look up, and it, that results in the in the number of no match that uh, that we're seeing here. So the, this is a very simple demonstration, but the the power of this, of course, you need to uh, balance the this this is cache to disk, so you need to of course uh, put the performance of your disk into view. But this allows you not just to create caches within a package, uh, like we used to do in 2008, where you could just create one cache and then leverage it across multiple data, uh, data flows in, in the same packet. Now you could extend that and go uh, outside of the packet itself to another package and leverage the same the same kind. That is just one way that one could uh, use use that. So I go back to the presentation. Okay, I'll go back. I need to come out of this screen here. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that's our line. So this is another feature. The reason I'm calling these out is because these are really uh, improvements that would uh, enhance uh, data warehouse uh, performance, and that's the reason I'm calling this uh, this this these out. There, there's data quality 
um, improvement, which uh, my colleague Jeff uh, presented uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I'm not going to cover that. But these 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 are areas that I believe would would significantly improve uh, the way we develop in exercise. A very good problem that arises when we change our data capture is uh, in enterprise data warehouse. Sorry, is we have data. Uh, and, and in the data, I mean, there's a lot of disguise because of huge data. Uh, the project I'm working on has the same issue. Uh, there's just a lot of data that is moving from server to server. Uh, you have a lot running ETL. Uh, the source system are overburdened by, by the ETL for the data warehouse, so sometimes you run out of memory. Um, uh, the, what you could do is release the amount of data you're processing. That, um, that is a no-brainer right there. And you also want to filter the record close to the source as much as possible, preferably to just pull the data, uh, change data from the source. One of the challenges you might have is, is your source in relation to a database. Um, if it's not, if it's a file or Excel, uh, you know, that will be a little bit difficult. But if it's a relation to a database, then uh, you have a possibility of uh, using uh, Microsoft SSI change uh, data capture. The traditional way of doing this, uh, I know most of you have done this uh, the same way before, uh, is uh, probably using checksum. And uh, I've used Arch bytes within SQL and within uh, SSI itself as a SQL component before. Uh, 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 SQL 2008 R2 improved on the usage of real version, uh, which I mean, these are still pretty cool ways of of, of doing this. Uh, no, the, 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 you know, the old reliable way of just uh, relying on the uh, last day modified, uh, hoping that the applications maintain, uh, this field. Uh, it, uh, other ways of, uh, that we used before, just pure writing custom code or buying some kind of application to, to read the transaction log or even compare snapshots. Uh, chain data capture, uh, it's, it's, it, it it's, it's a reliable way uh, if you, you know, the implementation for pulling from SQL and, and Oracle uh, has been, uh, it's been added to SSI 2012. Uh, and there's some other plugins from Antonity that you could uh, buy as well for DB2 and some other sources that, are, that don't come as part of the tool, but there are other plugins out there. Um, it, there, there are three main uh, kind of uh, tasks uh, involved. Uh, you have the, uh, the control task. Which allows you to define the start, you know, the, the log sequence number at the beginning of the log sequence number, which is okay. I want to start, uh, tracking from this point and, you know, on the end of the log sequence number. So the control task allows you to do that. Uh, you have the CDC source that allows you to, uh, leverage what you've just done with the control task to track, uh, changes, uh, to pull change records, uh, you know, uh, from the table. And you have the CDC splitter, um, which is like a multicast that allows you to, uh, you know, split the result based on, um, I mean, new records, uh, updates and, and, and delete. So with these three, it, you, you're quite capable of, of pulling incremental changes and dealing with the problem that we, we talked about before. Uh, the, the way it works is, you, uh, this is a typical, uh, initial load. Uh, this is what you see in a, um, in a control, in a control flow. You would have a CDC. Uh, I will demo this afterwards, by the way. You would have a CDC control task, uh, to start, uh, catching the, <coughs> the, uh, to, to start catching the, 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 the log sequence number, the start of it. Uh, you have your data flow to pull, you know, uh, look at right from the beginning, pull all the cells into your target. And you also have the, the CDC control task end uh, configured to mark the end of it. So for your pull, this is uh, this is what you would have in your control flow. Uh, once you've pulled the initial data, the next step will be to go to the incremental uh, pull of data. Uh, for the incremental pull of data in your data flow, this is typical of what you would have. Uh, like I said, I'm going to demo this for you to see that. You have the CDC source, uh, which I uh, said it allows you to pull changes in the table. Uh, you have the splitter that uh, allows you to, uh, depending on the type of changes, uh, split those and you load your target tables that you've, uh, your staging tables that you've pre-configured. For example, uh, your new rows will probably just go directly into your target table. Uh, your deleted row will be going to a staging table uh, that you've designed to hold deleted records. And your data row would, uh, you know, go into a staging table designed uh, design for 
updates. And you probably use a, a specifical uh, updates and inserts, or you can use the merge uh, to get these changes into the target table. Uh, so the, the incremental flow uh, from a full uh, what we looked at before was from the data flow perspective. Uh, from a full uh, control flow, it will look something like this. Uh, you're creating staging tables or you're truncating your staging tables. Uh, you you mark the start of, uh, of your uh, log sequence number. You have the data flow like that I just showed before on the previous deck on the previous screen that showed you uh, data coming, cat changes from the source and uh, distributing, uh, pushing those changes into uh, inserts and uh, updates or probably deletes. And um, you have to perform updates which would uh, update the target table by joining the target uh, to the uh, staging of the table and performing updates uh, based on that. And in, if you're doing deletes in most data warehouses, I don't expect you to do deletes with probably uh, most likely probably flagging uh, records as deleted uh, is soft. It's not delete as opposed to the physical delete. Either way, you will use a SQL statement in there to do that. Uh, you, uh, at, the, at the end of it, you flag, uh, you save the LSN number, and um, you know you could uh, truncate uh, the staging tables at this point because you've you've gotten the, the data in there. So that that's just uh, it. It looks like there's a lot going on, but the the way <coughs> the way this works is <coughs> excuse me. All this can be parameterized, and I will show you uh, in an enterprise environment, uh, you would set this up once and design as, as, as a template and use that template for all your uh, CDC kind of um, uh, packages. Okay, now I'll go to a demo to show you uh, how I've set up what I just uh, described. Okay. Let me just stop this. I have this going before, so let me stop that. Uh, what I've created here is the CDC uh, initial load. Before talking uh, talking through that, let me just go to here. Of the scripts that I used to set it up, uh, I used the AdventureWorks. I created a database uh, called SSIS uh, CDC on this call. Uh, that really is my source. Uh, it's also a database. I selected to top uh, 1,000 records just for this demo, uh, just to show uh, into this table. Uh, this uh, stop procedure is to enable the database for CDC. Uh, so if you have, uh, let's say, more than five, seven, eight, ten tables that you want to enable, you just enable the database once, and then subsequent steps will be to enable the tables uh, as opposed to the database. So it's a one-time setup for the database. Uh, what I'm doing in here is just adding the primary key uh, for you to. Uh, to use CDC, I mean, there must be a concept of, you know, what, how do you identify a record? Uh, and since I selected into this table, what I'm doing is just adding a primary key there. Uh, and then the very next step is uh, I want to enable tracking. Uh, this step here was to enable tracking at the database level. So now uh, I'm enabling the tracking at the, at the table level. Uh, I define the schema, uh, define the role. Uh, define the support changes. This is something that you would define for every table that you want to track. And in an enterprise environment, the way you would probably just do this is just grab a stop procedure around this and pass in the source. Uh, mostly what they'll be changing here will be the source name as a parameter to that stop prompt. And you have a table, uh, you create a table that holds, uh, you know, or create a view uh, to pull all the tables that you want to enable on the fly and just run it through the, look through the proc uh, to enable them. That is the way uh, you will set it up for an enterprise, uh, using an enterprise to bring tables into the CDC tracking system. And the, the very next thing is I need to prepare my staging tables that I'll be using to, uh, for this demo. Uh, so what I've done here is I selected from the CDC table uh, into a destination table uh, to get the right schema. I selected, to the, I did the same thing in order to get my updates and my delete, uh, delete tables. And I have a recovery here uh, that I used to make a change to uh, to my source, uh, to, to make change to my source table and see the changes kind of uh, push through to the CDC system. Uh, sorry. All right. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so now back here. For the initial load, um, 
I have my standard of CDC source. And if I open this, this is pointing to my uh, to my database that I just showed you. Bear me a sec. I don't know why it's not uh, it's not clear, but you can see it's pointing to my database. Um, it's just a typical uh, connection there, and destination um, is also pointing to the same database. Uh, but of course, in an enterprise environment, there will be two different databases. But for this demo, I just pointed that to the same thing. You probably see this is keeps showing up everywhere. This is a, a connection manager defined at the project level. Uh, so once I define a connection at the project level, you can leverage it across in all the packages in that project. So I'm not leveraging it here, but it's showing up. If I want to leverage that, I could just quite easily uh, uh, leverage that. So in my in this this is a page, a setup page. It's a, uh, like I said, this uh, this can all be parameterized. Um, there 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 are expressions available for all this. At the very top is my video.net uh, CDC source. The kind of operation that I want to perform uh, in this one, in this case, is to start the initial start. You can see there are other statuses in there which we're going to use later, but in this case, I'm just uh, starting the initial load. I'm defining the, the variable uh, that would hold the state of, of, of uh, the state of the, uh, of the change data control. Uh, in there, that is a variable that is at the bottom here. That is a variable, a string variable. Uh, connection manager for destination. I selected my destination connection manager. This is a table that holds the current, the, 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 the changes that are taking place, the CDC states, uh, physically are being held into that table. And the state name is CDC state. So this is a, conf a table configuration. And if you if you look at your properties here, and you go to expressions, and you go to expressions, you you see here that all those are available. Uh, they could be parameterized. So what that allows you to do is you could set this up once and use it for multiple. Uh, you could use it for uh, set as a template and parameterize every component that I just talked about. Okay, so that is starting. Uh, I'll just jump to end before I go to the data flow. I need to move pretty quickly because the deployment, uh, the packet catalog and deployment uh, to me are the most important. So I need to run through this pretty quick uh, in order to get that in. in. Uh, the same thing here, the same source. Uh, I select the idio.net source. Mark, uh, in this case, I'm marking the end. The first time I marked the beginning, uh, the state variable, uh, the state table, the connection manager for the table where the state is stored, and the state, uh, the actual state name uh, in there. And in here is what I'm doing. I'm selecting data from uh, from this table, and I'm loading it into this destination table. There is nothing fancy, fancy there. That is what I have for my uh, initial load. For my incremental load. It's slightly more involving, I mean, not more complications, just that you have more steps here. Um, I have the same setup there, um, but the only difference here, I'm not going to run through all the changes. The only difference here is I'm getting processing change, uh, which is different from initializing, the, the, which is different from what I had before, which is the MAC initial load start. And here at the end here, I'm also uh, getting the MAC process range. So it, that is the difference between them. But in between, uh, what I'm doing differently here is I just put this group here to show you the fanciful way of, you know, using group in, uh, in, in, in data flow, which, you know, it's, it's kind of cool because uh, you weren't able to do this before. Um, you see, there's not much you could do with it. It's just a fancy uh, way of looking at it. You can see there are no properties. It's just a way of grouping uh, stuff. If you have a very complex data flow, you could use the, the group to uh, to do that. You can see from here, if you have a very complex uh, data flow, uh, using leveraging groups will make it uh, look more better and readable. Okay, so back to what I was talking about. Uh, so the data source here, the, the difference is here, I'm using the CDC source, um, which is uh, the 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 I'm using CDC source, 
these are my tables. The 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 processing mode that I've selected is next. I want to I want to I don't want to get all the changes. I want to get the net changes. That what I changed since the last time I did the pool uh, in there. That goes. Uh, I'm doing account. Uh, just sorry that an account that goes into a splitter. And what this splitter does allows me to have three outputs. I could have the inserts, um, deletes, and updates. And once you have those, you could insert in there. You could insert those directly. You could do a row by row. I mean, I wouldn't advise that uh, to to uh, sorry, not insert. You could you could do a row by row update. Uh, but in this case, uh, I think it's best practice to just push the the changes into a table and use uh, use an update. Uh, like you like, uh, use an update uh, to to update the, the, the data. Uh, that is the way I would do that. But for this demo, uh, I'm just uh, you can see here for this demo, um, I pushed it into the, into the table, and then I'm calling a standard uh, update here. Like I said, you could use a merge to do update, uh, but, you know, to do the update here and insert if you want. But I've decided, instead of using a merge, I've decided to just push the new records directly into my destination table and also push the change records into my updates. Uh, so that's updates. And if you're doing deletes in an enterprise, you wouldn't really do deletes. You'd probably just be updating the record and flagging it. Uh, but it, just for the demo, uh, yeah, I do a delete and uh, end uh, the state here, my process range, I'm ending it here, and staging, I'm just tracking the staging table. So the, it looks like there's so many things going on, but this is a one-time setup uh, that you have to do. And once you've done this, and, the, and you have a template for CDC, uh, what will be changing for the most part will be you copy the template, uh, you, you copy the template, and then you come in here, you, you know, you, 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 you come in here, you, you select the, uh, the, the, the table you're interested in. By the way, these are all parameterized, um, so you could get this in the property, you could pass this in as a variable as well. So it's a one-time deal to set it up to work once you set it up. As a template, you can copy it and use it multiple times for different uh, different tables. Uh, I just want to see if there's anything here that I should call out that is not uh, obvious. I put in steps here of what I did to set it up. Um, this is what I put here. I would need to quickly move to deployment uh, because that is, to me, it's the most important uh, the most important future uh, in 2012. Okay, let me just go back here. Okay, package deployment. Um, <clears throat> the this is the way we we are familiar. Those of us who have been doing exercise, and uh, if you've ever done exercise, you must have deployed at least one package. Uh, it's uh, the way it works is it uses the package uh, deployment uh, uh, model. Uh, it uses the the package configuration, um, you know, for you know for for deployment. Um, most of the settings that you have, if not all, are all package based. And there is just, and it, there is just no way to, even though you deploy to, uh, MSDB, if you, if you decide not to deploy to a fast system, even though MSDB serves as a re repository, it, it's not an integrated repository that allows all those, um, you know, packages to, to work together. So that is what we have before. And what I've shown here is, um, the, at the top of the screen is, is what you have for 2012. And at the bottom is uh, what, uh, we have before for 2000 and, uh, 2005 and 2008. In 2012, you can see here, uh, the convert to legacy deployment model. I took this screenshot uh, after I converted uh, my packages to project based. So uh, if 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 I did the reverse, it will allow you to convert back to uh, to to project. Uh, this is SRS 2012 and this is 2005. So in in the old legacy deployment way. Uh, it, it's actually if you upgrade because I did have to, uh, did upgrade to a couple of my packages. Um, uh, it, it defaults to the uh, to it defaults to uh, the legacy way of of doing it. Uh, then you cannot convert that to project. Uh, there is a 
there is a wizard uh, which is straightforward. Just right click on your project and allows you to just convert. If it, uh, if it fails, it's going to show you the error messages. It's pretty straightforward to convert the system packages. And um, in this case, this is package configuration to, to manage friend and child. And I just demoed how in 2012, how you can quite easily uh, pass, uh, you know, uh, variables or values between friend and child. In the project deployment model, I hope this is clear, uh, but what we're looking at here is we have the, uh, we, we, you have the SQL engine here, you have the integration services catalog, which is a new concept of a central repository, uh, that has to packages to it. Um, you have the deployment wizard, um, the, the, the way you have the migration wizard. What this diagram is, is, is showing really is you have a more simple way to manage uh, uh, SSIS uh, packages. Uh, you, instead of dealing with one package at a time, you deploy your package as a unit, uh, as a file called is uh, That is a new name, uh, and you probably get used to it pretty soon uh, during the time. Um, uh, you know, Ten more minutes. Okay, let me just run real quick. Uh, package, package configurations are no longer used; they're replaced with, um, you know, uh, project environment variables. Environment variable in the sense of 2012 is different from system environment variable in that we set up for the computer. Uh, so it, it replaces package configuration uh, is replaced by environment uh, variable and, and parameter combined together allows you to get rid of the old package configuration way. Uh, you, of course, it's easier now to, uh, to reference that package from parent, like I just saw. It's also because now it's all centrally stored in a, in, in a relation database. You can actually, uh, automate, uh, you know, do a lot of stuff in Transat SQL to execute packages because of this, uh, integrated platform. Um, the package deployment is just a primitive way you generate an ISPAC. Uh, you deploy that to integration services catalog. If it doesn't exist, you create it. Uh, then you, just like the old way, you create folders within the catalog and where you deploy your packages to. I'm running through this because I need to get to the demo because we don't have much time. Um, management can be done in, in, in SSI, sorry, in, in SQL Server uh, Management Studio. Uh, there are built-in reports, uh, in, in the SSI uh, catalog. There are built-in reports in there. And one of the cool things is if you've developed frameworks which was in, in SSI 2005 or 2008, and you want to, of course, you want to continue, even though some of the, uh, some of what we put in our frameworks have been kind of built in into this, uh, this, uh, this model, uh, you could tie them together and leverage what the Microsoft now provides, uh, out of the box plus what you provide from your existing framework. Uh, the, the catalog here, just three categories real quick, uh, tells you to, of course, set, uh, parameters, uh, set up environment. An environment, the concept of environment is, so for example, uh, dev, uh, dev, uh, production, QA, those are, when I say environment, those are what I'm talking about. And you can also have centralized, uh, configuration, security is enhanced, as you probably see here. Uh, you could do two, even to a very low level security to a particular package because you can define folders and, and within the folders, uh, you can define security, uh, for folders. Uh, there is automate, automatic login, uh, you know, pre, post, and event, uh, error login is all automatic. Uh, there are built in performance, uh, uh, performance tracking, uh, built into, and there's a dashboard, which you can link to your framework. If you develop a framework, you can link the dashboard to your framework to have a, a broader uh, dashboard for your ETL. Okay. Environment variable, uh, environment and environment variable. Uh, each project can have multiple environments. For example, I, uh, my project, I could define dev, QA, um, test environments, uh, for, uh, for my project. And a, 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 an environment can hold multiple variables. For example, for dev environment, I might have a source connection, um, variable or parameter. I might have a target connection variable or parameter. I might have some other config file. Uh, so you could have multiple variables per environment. Uh, of course, you want to keep the name the same of those variables across environment, uh, and the reason will be obvious as when I get to the demo. Environment variables allow you to define values for the, uh, the for the parameters that the, the you created in your package. For example, when you, uh, I think when we get to the, uh, 
to the presentation in the demo, you will see that you define environments, you define variables for particular environments. For example, I could say for dev, you could define multiple variables in dev and multiple variables in CUA as well and production. Uh, the, what, what really replaces package configuration is environment reference, because environment reference is what allows you to now now you have environment, you have environment variable, you have parameters. What brings them together is environment, uh, uh, is, uh, is environment reference. And the, the picture here is a way to completely remove uh, what we used to have as package configuration. I have uh, two, two, uh, two parameters, P1, one at uh, project level, one at uh, the package level, which is 1P2. And they have a created environment, for example, it could be production E1. A defined environment variable, uh, EV1 and EV2, and environment reference allows me to tie them together. So uh, what we used to use, config file for, use the old environment variable or XML indirect configuration for in 2005 and 2008 have uh, completely been replaced if you want to go through uh, this route uh, in, uh, in there. Um, it's, uh, you know, I just want to get quickly to the demo because of time. Okay. Um, what I'm doing right now is I, I created a package um, that is called, uh, you know, just a package with a data flow. I uh, just wanted to show you there's nothing fancy here. Select your record, look up um, key. Uh, there's nothing here that I'm interested in showing. It's just the ability to deploy uh, that I want to talk about. Uh, you can see from here, I defined uh, two parameters. Uh, I just, it's good to have a naming standard. I use a uh, prime DW string and uh, prime uh, uh, source string. And here I put in the, the, the values for my source and target uh, connections. And if you come in here, um, there's the sources at VentureWorks. And I have the target here. And I also created just to show how you could pass values between parameters and variable, because parameters are not replacing variables, I created uh, two. Sorry, I created two uh, two variables here: source connection string, and if you go, its expression is uh, defined as true. If you go to the expression here, what I'm doing is I'm just assigning the parameter to that variable because I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff with the parameter outside of the project. So I'm assigning whatever I pass into the parameter to the variable uh, in there. So uh, I also created a DW. You notice that uh, if you use the bit helper, the FX here tells you that there is a pressure involved. You can also notice here in FX, you can see this. This is just a visual way of knowing that you're using expressions. Um, so having said that, the key thing I wanted to get from this is the fact that I've defined, uh, I've not defined any project level. Now, I could have, but I've decided not to. Uh, project level uh, parameters in there. Just let me a sec here. If you want to take here, these are the options that are now available here. You could build, rebuild, uh, you could deploy. Uh, if I click on deploy, I'm just going to watch the motion here. It's telling me that I've already, uh, I've already deployed this, and I'm saying, okay, just go ahead. And I'm deploying that. It goes through here and tells me the, the status of the deployment. I believe this is the most, uh, the most important uh, feature of SSI: is decentralized, uh, uh, decentralized uh, repository. Because uh, when I go to Management Studio, then you will see why this is more important. The concept is, is this. You define your packages, uh, your project the same way like before. Uh, whatever you were using package configuration for in the past, now you would, you would, uh, you have package configuration because you want to pass and install from outside of the package during execution. You define those as parameters. You can have the parameters directly on the on the objects, I could have just put the value of this. Uh, uh, the, the, I could have put the, the in the expression for this connection. I could assign it to the parameter directly. I just wanted to show you that you could assign parameters to variable. I could have just put in the, the parameter directly here. Uh, in, in here, I could 
I could just, instead of doing this, I could just have assigned, uh, even though here uh, I'm using this package here, I could have just assigned it directly without going through the variable. But I just wanted to show you that you could pass this around. So now that I've deployed, uh, I've deployed here, what I did before getting here was uh, you right click here, you see the greater create catalog, it's a one time setup. You create a catalog, which is a repository. And once you create a catalog in repository, because you cannot deploy to, you, know, you need to deploy to a catalog. Uh, and then you end up with, with what you're seeing here, SSIS DB. Uh, about three deployment, three projects. One is AdventureWorks, uh, SSIS Demo. Uh, I just deployed to SSIS Demo 2. You've probably noticed here there are two folders per project. You have the project and environment, project and environment. So if we go to project, uh, demo ETL, that's what I just deployed. And these are the packages here that I deployed. In here, I've created environments on uh, development QA. Uh, in order to create environments, you just create environment. Um, just want to show you what I did. And uh, this, if I say this is a uh, test environment, and uh, within test environment, uh, right click properties. Um, you have variable. I talked about security. So you have variable. This is where you define the variables for the um, for, for, for the environment. These variables, you have in mind, this is what you want to tie to the parameters that you define, uh, project or packet level parameters that you define in your, in your project. So uh, I won't work through this because of time. Uh, in development, I've gone ahead in development and I've created two, uh, two variables. One to hold my parameter uh, for data warehouse, the second one to hold my source uh, parameters. Uh, put your description here, whether it is sensitive and the values, I'll put it, I've copied the, the, the connection string right in there. Uh, in production as well, I did the same thing. You want to keep the name because it's very unlikely you're going to be passing different parameters between dev and production. Uh, for, for about 99% of cases, you're going to be passing. Um, the same set of different values for the same uh, private names. So having created the 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 the, uh, the variables, the very next step is you come in here and configure. Uh, what you're configuring here is, is this. Here I want to tie uh, my stuff together. The scope is it defaults to this, but I'm interested in this in this package. In here. Let me just go to reference real quick. Let me remove, remove production reference. Yeah. What I've done here is this coming from my package. You can see that's my package. Those are the two that I define uh, in my package. And here, I want to here clicking on this exclusive sign here. I want to assign the values to it. So I come in here. You could have the edit. You could use the default value, which is coming from a packet. I want to use environment variable. So I'm, I'm linking the environment variable to the parameter. This is all I'm doing here is I'm linking the environment variable to the parameter. That that environment variable could apply to dev stage or QA. But the concept is I'm not linking it to dev. I'm not linking it to states. I'm linking the environment variable defined, which is consistent across my environment. I'm linking it to the parameter. So that's what I've done here. And I went to the other one here and I did the same thing. Environment variable, the source connection. Uh, so once that link is complete, you know that you have a, a reference um, here because the folder reference, I'm going to go in here and create a reference for production as well. Once you do that, where this comes together is the integration, which uh, I'm going to finish in a bit, uh, but is the integration between uh, SQL agents with the uh, with the uh, the catalog. So now, if I want to execute this package, if I come in here, um, what it's telling me is I have these two parameters uh, coming from the package. What do you want to do with it? I want you to tell it, you know what? I want you to run uh, this package in development environment. Well, I wanted to run it in production environment. You can see it just filled it up directly uh, in there. If you remove that, it wouldn't know. If you remove that, it wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, just to let you know that the connection managers also exposed directly here. You could change them here. 
but I would advise that you go through this a permanent solution. So this is the way you're running interactively. But if you want to schedule this as a job, I've created uh, one here. If you want to schedule this as a job, uh, I could, all I did was just to create a job, add, it, add the ETL task to it, uh, run as you, I mean, in, in the enterprise, you're going to be using a proxy here. Um, I, I selected the catalog that I'm interested in, the server name. I'm using Windows authentication. It will allow you to browse to the catalog and you select the package that you're interested in. Then you go to configuration. In configuration, this is important. This is where you define, you pick the environment for which uh, you want it to run. So here, you could pick development, production, or QA. Once you do this here, it would map the variables, uh, the parameter to the environment variable. Remember, you created the environment, uh, you created the environment, which is dev, QA, and maybe product, depending on the number of environments you have. You now created environment variables. And then you assign values to those environment variables. Now you're linking the assigned values of those environment variables to the actual parameters that is coming from your package. And that is where environment reference allows you to bring them together. And what you're looking at here is equivalent to what I showed you in the, in the catalog. This environment reference allows me to tie what is coming. So here, if I select this, it will just, that means it will automatically be running for production. If I select development, it will automatically be running for development. So the, the, even though I, I went through this pretty fast, but the key you know, takeaway uh, for, for deployment is you define parameters. Um, those are uh, parameters for whatever you want to assign value to outside of your package or outside of your project. Uh, you deploy your, uh, your, your project to, to the catalog. And once you deploy it, you define environment, which is a one-time deal. I don't expect you to define environment every time. You probably define your environment the very first time you deploy your solution, uh, you know, to two or three or four environments, dev, QA, production, or test. And once you define environments, you define, you assign values, uh, you define environment variables, and then you assign values. It's quite possible that as you have more packages, you're going to have more environment variables because you have more parameters in different packages, so it's possible for that to grow. So that is not a one-time effort. Once you once you set that you you set your uh, once you set that the very next thing is now you now map your parameter to the environment variable depending on what environment you want to run off. If you want it to run in dev, you you do the map, you link them together. Uh, I showed you how to do that interactively from using the utility, and it's also integrated into SQL Agent. Uh, so that totally replaces the usage of uh, indirect XML config file combined with environment variable from the computer that we had in 2005 and uh, 2008. Okay. So, I mean, that is, uh, sorry, I, I, the, uh, I left the most important to you. Uh, to, to the last, but i just like to thank you for spending time today, you know, taking time out of lunch to, uh, to attend the webcast. Thank you, and I'll go to you now. Thank you, Colo. That was a great presentation, um, and thank you for those who have stuck on. I do have a few polling questions that I'm going to click through, and I would greatly appreciate your feedback. The for first question, was this content helpful for your business, yes or no? Great, thank you. The last, next question I have, uh, please rate the presentation content. Excellent, good, or poor? Great, and the last question I have for you is, would you like us to schedule a follow-up, yes or no? We will be forwarding the link to view a recording of this webcast once it does become available. Again, thank you so much for everyone for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webcast. You are now free to disconnect.